Good morning. How many empty nesters here? Raise your hand. How many can't wait to be empty nesters? Raise your hand. <laughs> William, his oldest is four or five. <laughs> Six. How many used to be empty nesters but your kids double crossed you and moved back? <laughs> Those are the ones who have trouble lifting up their... <laughs> well, Lise and I, my wife and I, we're at that stage of life, you know, empty nesters. We've been there for a while. Our four children have all left home, all making a life for themselves. They're building their own homes, their own families, their own marriages. And of course, this is a, a joyful time for us as we observe them maturing and establishing their own families. You know, it's, it's wonderful to observe that, to watch that uh, taking place. Uh, you people who still have children at home, you know, hang in there. There's, uh, there are wonderful stages. You know, we've always said, Lise and I have always said, isn't it amazing how God puts certain rewards at different times of life? You know, when you're young, you, know, you think all the good stuff's at the beginning, but not necessarily. There's a lot of good stuff all the way through life. God has put good stuff from beginning to, from beginning to end. And the empty nest period, watching your own children building their lives, this is a, this is a a good thing. Uh, uh, of course, watching them actually leave home, you know, that part is always filled with apprehension. There's so many things that you want to tell them, so many dangers in the world you want to, you want to protect them from. I'm convinced that all parents want their children you know, to find joy and success, peace, want them to find a good marriage partner, a true purpose in life. So before they leave, there seems to be so much more you want to teach them and so little time and opportunity to do so because one thing is true, they, they grow up so, so fast. The time simply flies by. So this morning I speak not only as a, as a preacher but also as a parent perhaps even on behalf of all parents, as I share with you some advice that the Bible gives to those who are about to leave home now and in the, in the future. You know, school is starting, a lot of people going off to college, some people finishing up and going on to a job and a new life. Even the small ones, you know, in our home, uh, some of our grandchildren going now into school for the first time, into pre-K or kindergarten or whatever, and the, that's a kind of leaving home too, the situation changes. So here's some advice that the Bible gives us about leaving home. First of all, it says, keep your way pure. Those of you who are leaving home, keep your way pure. You know, in uh, Psalm 119 verses nine to 16, a couple of verses that was just read by Mark, the writer refers to the relationship between God's word and young people and he says that the way that a young person can keep his or her way pure is by obeying God's word. So in that context, I want to read that passage over again to you. The writer says, how can a young man, or in this case, a young woman, how can a young man keep his way pure? And he answers the question, by keeping it according to your word. With all my heart I have sought you. Do not let me wander from your commandments. And so here the author expresses the idea in a picturesque way by saying that God's word is actually a road. It's, it's a way. It's the pure way. And if one wants to travel the pure way, that person has to travel the road indicated or traced out by God's word. The concept is that when a young person leaves home, there are a variety of roads or ways that he or she can take. The pure way, however, 
is the way of God's word. In this passage, he explains what taking the pure way consists of. How does one walk along that way? And he mentions several things. First of all, he says, if you're going to, if you're going to go along this way, you must first treasure the word. Verse 11, he says, your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin against you. Keep God's word a priority, a treasure in your life, even after you've left home. Keeping the word as your basis for making decisions, for forming your actions, will keep you from making mistakes. The Bible provides the way to avoid sin, and in life it's a lot easier to avoid sin than to pay the consequences for sin or to ask for forgiveness. Another way to pursue the pure way, ask for enlightenment. Verse 12, he says, Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. You know, in another book of the Bible, in the book of James, James says that we should ask God for wisdom. The word is always with you, even if you leave home and it can provide the wisdom and insight that you need to solve your personal problem. Isn't it strange? The Bible's the last place people go to when they have problems, and yet it has the solution to those problems. If you're going to pursue the pure way, then you also need to proclaim the word. Not only treasure it, ask for enlightenment, but proclaim it as well. Verse 13, he says, with my lips I have told of all the ordinances of your mouth. Now the word ordinance here is just another way of saying or referring to the scripture itself, more, more specifically in, in the writer's case, the law. Once we have found the pure way, bringing others to the way helps us keep uh, on the way. You know, when you're in the, in, the, in the process of helping other people find the way, it's a good way for you to remain faithful as well. When we leave home, we are easily tempted to follow other ways, but sharing our faith not only brings others to Christ, it helps us stay on track ourselves. Another way to stay on the way is to appreciate the way. Verse 14, I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies as much as in all riches. Be happy that you've chosen that. Don't, don't be a Christian, you know, don't be a, a sourpuss, I'm a Christian, I can't do anything. You know, what? wow, what an attitude. Be happy that you've chosen this way. The author compares the pure way with other riches that he has known and declares that it compares favorably. He says following God's way is the best way for him and it has made him happy. If we're not happy as Christians, there are usually two reasons. I mean, if you really are a Christian and you're just not happy as a person, usually two reasons. One, we're either secretly involved with willful sin and trying to be a Christian at the same time. You know, Jesus said you can't serve two masters and be happy. You can't, you can't do it. Or we don't understand. The word is not in us yet. The remedy to the causes of unhappiness is to follow the way that you have chosen. And if you follow the pure way with all your heart and soul and body, you will love the way and it will make you happy. Number five, he says, you need to study God's word. If you're on the pure way, it requires you to study the word. Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. Now the words that the author uses, meditate, keep before his eyes, command, statutes, so on and so forth, suggests more than a, a casual glance at the word when he's at the temple. He meditates, he talks to himself about the word. It's under his eyes, he studies it, he reads it. These expressions suggest that God's word uh, is with him every day in a, in a significant way. He doesn't forget what he's heard in church the minute he walks out of church. He chews on it throughout the week so it becomes part of him. He's a, you know, he's a regular Bible reader even if there's no program or project. Because being a regular Bible reader, that's part of his life. 
Number six, if you're going to be on the way and stay on the pure way, you have to rejoice in God's word. Verse 16, he says, I shall delight in your statutes. The word provides encouragement and hope and confidence when things are difficult. The other ways in life offer other solutions to our problems which work, you know, they do to one degree or another, but God's word provides a final solution and an everlasting hope that gives us joy and happiness. Every night I go to bed and as my head hits the pillow and as I drift off to sleep, I drift off to sleep in prayer. I know God isn't insulted. He knows I need to sleep. He made me that way. But I want the last words that filter through my mind to be words that are offered to Him. The last thing that I see as my consciousness you know, is removed from me and I fall into sleep, I want them to be words of praise and thanksgiving and I want to be communing with Him to the very last moment of my consciousness. And in the morning when I wake up, and you know how you slide and you just, you, you put your feet on the floor first, you know, take a moment you know, before you get out, well, you, you older guys do, I don't know about you younger guys, but it takes a minute more as you, you, you get a little older. The minute that my feet hit the floor before I get up to begin my day, I begin with prayer. Praying for someone that I've thought of, praying for someone who's sick, praying for someone that Johnny has mentioned in the prayer card, praying for someone that I met that day, praying for someone that I've had maybe some conflict with. The day ends and the day begins with prayer. And all throughout the day, there are occasions to pray. I rejoice in being a Christian. I embrace it totally. And then he finishes in verse 16, this small passage. He says, I shall not forget your word. Always go to God's word in every situation, whether good or bad. Wherever you are and whatever the circumstances, the word will serve you. So, the first and most important advice I would give a person leaving home would be to take your Bible with you and let it be your guide for the way that you will live your life and let it be your guide consciously. In leaving home, everything you have been taught will be tested and if you forget how you ought to act, if you need encouragement and direction, God's word will provide it for you wherever you go and it will guarantee the safety of your soul. And so the first piece of advice on leaving home, choose the pure way, choose the Bible way. Number two advice, choose your friends wisely. Choose your friends wisely. Choose your friends wisely because you do what your friends do and you become what your friends are, and you marry who you befriend. You know, friendships are so important and satisfying. The Bible speaks of friendships that blessed the individuals and gave their lives joy. We know the stories, Ruth and Naomi, David and Jonathan, that's who I'm reading about in my regular Bible reading about the love of David and Jonathan, the love that they had for each other in their friendship. Uh, Daniel and his three companions, Mary and Martha, Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus. In each of these friendships, there were some common threads that made these healthy and productive relationships. First of all, these friendships were based on mutual respect, not mutual weakness. You know, some friendships begin because the individuals share similar weaknesses or bad habits. I remember in Montreal, you know, uh, uh, the congregation there, uh, a long time ago when it was first in Verdun. And you know, a lot of new Christians just had come out of the world and a lot of them were smokers. And boy, in between, we had, we had to imagine, we had to put in the bulletin, you know, we had to put a notification in the bulletin, brothers, because it was men, not women, brothers, please, do not stand in the foyer smoking in between Bible class and worship. Now think of the optics. Bible class is over. The smokers gather together. Why do they gather together? 
Is their common thing Christ? No, their common thing is tobacco. That's their common thing. And they go down, imagine going to the foyer over here and lighting up while visitors <laughs> coming to church. <coughs> Could you tell us where the sanctuary is? <coughs> Some friendships begin because the individuals share similar weaknesses and bad habits. This is not healthy. It usually leads to trouble. Jonathan loved David because he admired David's faith and David's courage. And David loved and appreciated Jonathan's humility and Jonathan's generosity. So find friends that you admire and respect and can be proud to bring home and introduce to your parents. You know, a friend that you don't want to bring home shouldn't be your friend. A girl that you don't want to bring home to meet your mom should not be your girlfriend. Secondly, these friendships shared similar beliefs. You know what I was talking about, David and Jonathan, Naomi, and so on and so forth. They, they shared similar beliefs. Daniel and his friends, because of their shared faith, were able to withstand tremendous obstacles and were able to help each other succeed in difficult circumstances. If none of your friends are Christians, it won't be long before you're no longer acting like a Christian yourself. Because something's got to give there. If you don't look for Christian friends away from home, you won't find them. The devil will make sure. The number one reason why Christians get divorces, number one reason, I'm, I'm not making accusations, I'm just citing, citing statistics, number one reason, they marry non-Christians. And the difference in, 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 in faith you know, is a clash, is a problem within the marriage. Did I say they can't succeed? No, they can succeed. But there's a higher rate of failure in that context. If you cultivate relationships exclusively with non-Christians, it won't be very long before you will cultivate their habits and beliefs, and chances are that you'll bring home an unbelieving spouse. And it's very hard to raise believing children when your spouse is not a believer. Very difficult, not impossible but very difficult. And then thirdly, these friendships were based on mutual sacrifice. You find out who your friends are when the going gets rough, or there's, or there's money at stake. Choose friends that can give as well as receive. Paul risked his reputation in Jerusalem to bring the Greek boy, Timothy, along with him on a missionary journey. Timothy traveled many miles. He even stayed in prison to be close to Paul and help him during that difficult time. It's said that Epaphroditus nearly died during a trip to deliver money and messages to Paul. If you see that your friends only around to receive or, or, or buying you off to be with them, then you don't have a friend that'll stand by you in the day of trouble. When you leave home, Choose friends that you can respect, that you can share your faith with, and who are loyal to your friendship. The type of friends you choose, and you do choose your friends, they're not forced on you. The type of friends that you choose will determine the kind of life that you have. So choose wisely. And so advice on leaving home, one, choose the pure way. Two, choose Christian friends. And three, find something to give yourself to. Find something to give yourself to. If your training and career is simply based on getting the most for yourself, you will not be happy. For example, you know, I want to be a doctor, why? So I could just make a lot of money and buy stuff. You won't be happy. You'll be amused, but you won't be happy. I, I want to marry someone who's well-educated or well-placed so we can be comfortable. Well, you might be comfortable, but you won't be happy. We don't want a family so we can build a nice house and have a car and go on vacation and so on and so forth. Yeah, try that. 
and in 25 years, come see me about that and see how that's working for you. The attitude that says, I will use my skills and talents and opportunities to make my life better and make myself happier, that attitude is doomed to failure. It is doomed to failure because it violates a basic life principle described by Jesus. In Acts 20, 35, he says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now this is a rule of life. It's like gravity. You know, gravity is a rule of physics. It doesn't matter if you know the rule or not. The, you know, the, rule of phys uh, the, rule, the, um, the law of gravity is always in effect. Well, this spiritual law, that it is more blessed to give than to receive, that's always in effect. Even if you don't know that Jesus is the one who said that, that rule is always in effect. You know, a lot of rich and famous people are obsessive and unhappy and suicidal. Why? Because they violate this rule. You ever wonder why people who give themselves, social workers, nurses, volunteers, you know, public safety people, so on and so forth, you know, people who are serving other people as part of their natural work, you know, are better balanced, happier in general? You know, Jesus wasn't talking about giving money in church. He was talking about giving as a lifestyle. You're more happy as one who is a giver than one who is a receiver. Sure, there are times when you're receiving the blessings of others, absolutely. We're all on the receiving end sometimes, but if you're never on the giving end, you cannot be happy. So regardless of what you end up doing when you leave home, find a way to give yourself to others who need. I mean, you know, coach a team, volunteer somewhere, uh, you know, perhaps take on a career that's a service type career, uh, bring yourself to your own, give yourself to your own family. I'm not even talking about in church, you know, we, we talked about VBS, you know how many man hours went into VBS by certain individuals, you know, there's always the danger, you know, I, 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 I've said it and others said, well we won't mention any names because we might forget someone. And that's true, but forgive me, I might forget someone, but I have to mention, you know, Mike Coghill, Mike and Jessica, you know, what a great, uh, what a great uh, young couple, what energy that they bring to this uh, congregation and to this project. And, and who did you see a lot of? A lot of people you saw, you said, well, I saw a lot of Celestia, and I saw a lot of Bonnie, and I saw the Bairds, you know, the amazing decorations, I saw uh, Lindsay, you know, I mean, I saw people who were here early and left late. Very late. And I saw young moms, you know, I mean it was a six o'clock start. <laughs> and I have to tell you, I wasn't sure that that was going to work, a six o'clock start, but I saw young moms pulling up, you know, and with a gaggle of kids, you know, and having fed them supper and changed them and so on and so forth, and they made it. And I don't know if you saw that video with all the pies being thrown around. The kids weren't laughing, they were shrieking with happiness. I asked one mom, so did you get your kid to sleep? <laughs> what a joke. Yeah. They were tired, they were sweaty, they had these red, red cheeks, but you couldn't wipe the grin off their faces. Why? because so many, and again, I've only named some people, please forgive me if I didn't name you and, and you really gave yourself, because some people decided to give of themselves. That's what made the difference. You know, as a Christian, you have so many opportunities to give yourself to others in the name of Christ as you, you pray for others, give to others, serve others, share your faith with others. And I know that in this congregation there are more acts of kindness and love and benevolence done that we don't know about than that are, that are done that we do know about. I, I know this for a fact. You may even choose to give your entire career to God and go into some kind of full-time ministry. This would be a great blessing if the Lord were to call you. So 
if you're far from home or if you're discouraged or if you're unhappy, ask yourself, is the reason for my sorrow because I haven't received enough or is it because I haven't given enough? You'll be surprised that usually when the receive column is full and the give column is kind of empty, we usually cannot enjoy our blessings. We can only rejoice in what we have when we begin giving some of it away. Remember that when you're on your own, when you're building your own wealth, when you're building your own life and your family. You know, I'm sure that there are parents out there who are thinking of all the things that I've neglected to mention. Call your mother. I didn't, I didn't say that. Get some good life insurance or health insurance. Yes, that too. Don't get into too much debt. Yes, all that good advice. But I believe, however, if young people leaving home remember, A, to live their lives according to God's word, to continue to ask, what would the Lord have me say or do in this situation? And if they're to select friends and a mate that will help them to get to heaven, ask themselves the question, are my friends, is this partner, this date I've got, are these people interested in eternal things or just temporary things? And thirdly, find a way to give yourself to help others, to spread the gospel, that you become givers and not takers. If you remember to do those things, then you will be happy and you will have productive lives and that you'll, you'll never be ashamed or afraid to go home and you'll be reunited with your Christian family in the heavenly home with God. Time comes. This will be a home that no one will ever want to leave ever again. So if you're contemplating leaving home soon, I hope you take this advice to heart. If you're a parent, remember to give your children this advice. Perhaps there are some here today who are uh, who have an earthly home, but have not yet guaranteed their place in God's heavenly home. If you're in this position, we invite you to reserve a place now by confessing Christ and repenting of your sins, being baptized today. Perhaps like the prodigal son, you've left the safety of your heavenly father's house and you've gone into the world, but you want to return home today. If you're in that position, then I encourage you to be restored today through confession of sin and prayer. And then perhaps you're looking for a church home and you'd like to call our church home your home congregation. We invite you to come forward and place membership today if that's what is necessary in your life. Whatever your need, I encourage everyone who needs a home with Christ in whatever way to come now as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.